you, thank you very much, Mary. Uh, we are very delighted to be invited to contribute to this uh, seminar uh, series. I should say that the bulk of the research that has been done has been done by Beata, and and um, uh, what we plan to do is uh, for me to say a little bit about the um, human rights education framework uh, and the human rights approach that we are developing. And of course, we would welcome lots of feedback on that. And then uh, Beata will talk about her research and I hope that uh, the whole pattern will become clear to you all. Um, as you can see, uh, Beata's put up her first slide, um, uh, sexual harassment in school is, is our broad topic. And I think the next slide, we um, spend a little moment introducing ourselves. Just to say a little bit about my background and, and where I'm coming from. I'm working in Norway at a university in the Southeast of the country, and I've been doing that since 2010, but my background is very much an academic background and I'm the editor in chief of a journal called Human Rights Education Review, which is a scholarly journal, but one which we hope reaches also out to colleagues in NGOs and to colleagues um, in the teaching profession, unions, other connected areas, uh, because we really see a very close relationship between um, theory and um, scholarly ideas and research and practice. And it's very much uh, an intersection between the, the two. I'm coming uh, to human rights and human rights education from a background in history and sociology. My approach is very interdisciplinary and I've been working in this uh, field uh, as well as citizenship education, education for democracy for a long, a long time. And um, I'm drawing on my experiences in Norway, but I'm also, um, as I think about the ideas of human rights, drawing on uh, experiences of teaching and research in many different countries, including post-conflict conflict societies, but also particularly universities in the UK, in the United States, uh, Costa Rica, uh, China, and Japan. So you can see it's a very broad, uh, experience I'm bringing uh, to this uh, um, this topic. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Beate goldschmidt Yerlev, and I'm so excited that we got an invitation from the Steve Sinet Foundation, and that you all have joined us this afternoon. It's uh, for some uh, a tricky uh, timing with with kids and and dinner and so on and and I know that many of you are joining us from different parts of the world and I just want to say that I really appreciate that. Uh, I'm uh, a political scientist and I hold a master's in peace studies and conflict transformation. So one of my um, sources of inspiration that Audrey and I have been talking about is Johan Galtung. Although I haven't written about him explicitly, he was um, influential for my early writing, I would say. And um, later uh, I started teaching. I've been a teacher for six years in upper secondary school. And I've been teaching social studies, um, uh, sociology, politics, and human rights. And, uh, and in 2016, um, I just had an epiphany <laughs> in a way when I was teaching because uh, in 2016, uh, we um, had this very uh, famous TV series called Scum uh, in which a girl, 17 year old girl, she experienced being drugged and she thought that she was raped by her boyfriend's brother in this TV series. And when I saw this series, it just dawned on me that we really have to address sexual violence that targets young adolescents and children. And when I uh, spoke to my colleagues about this, they were like, mm, I'm not sure if I'm qualified to talk about these issues. I'm not sure if I should. And they were kind of reluctant whether or not it's it's an issue for, for school at all in a way. And that really inspired me to um, pursue uh, a PhD uh, where 
uh, and I'm currently doing my PhD now, uh, looking into how teachers address sexual violence in upper secondary school from different perspectives. And uh, the, um, the research that I will be focusing on today um, is uh, based on uh, two of uh, my articles, Children's Rights and Teachers' Responsibilities, uh, where I uh, address why teachers are reluctant to address rape among young peers and child sexual abuse. And also, um, my most recent um, article, Me Too in School, uh, that I wrote together with my supervisor, uh, Irene Trisnes. And um, we are, uh, and together with uh, Irene Trisnes and uh, a group of, of colleagues, we are now writing a book on controversial, emotional, and sensitive issues in school, uh, where we focus on uh, teachers' emotions and how teachers' emotions are uh, intertwined with the overall organization of teaching. And that is also um, one of the aspects that I will be uh, discussing further and uh, later on in this presentation. And now we will tune back to Audrey. Okay, and um, while um, are we move to the next slide, I want to say just that these two articles that uh, Beata has written are available to anyone. You, it, The journal is not um, exclusive to universities. You don't have to have a, a subscription. They're, they're open access. So if anybody wants to follow through their ideas, um, and they're very accessible, they're not written in an obscure scholarly style. I think you'll find them very accessible um, in, in terms of their um, approach. But I want to turn now to human rights education and to think about it as a right and as an obligation. Uh, we are all very, very familiar with uh, the right to education. We talk about it almost casually, I think, although uh, during the pandemic, um, the right to education has become a, a critical issue for, for many children who, who have been excluded uh, from their regular schooling and um, and their regular contact with teachers. Uh, and that's true both in um, uh, high income countries like the one I'm based in right now. I'm, I'm actually at home in the UK. And it, it's also true, of course, in, in uh, many uh, lower income countries. So we talk about the right to education very frequently. We less frequently talk about the right to human rights education to a, an education which is founded in human rights. And where, um, and this was established right, right back in, in, in 1948 in international law in the, in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And that actually read, education shall be directed to strengthening of respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms. It shall promote understanding, tolerance, friendship among all nations, religious, uh, racial or religious groups. And that's a kind of baseline. That's a minimum uh, that, that uh, we can expect. And it also talks about um, uh, based on the um, Charter of the United Nations, which spells out some of these ideas in more detail. My concern for decades now has really been that teachers don't necessarily um, address these kinds of questions in their initial education. Uh, mo you know, teachers, of course, are aware that there's a right to education, but when we talk to teachers and ask them what about the right to human rights education, um, they often look a bit uh, uh, bemused. It's not something which I was taught about, uh, and I have worked also as a teacher at, at different levels in, 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 um, uh, in schools. And this right wasn't just put as a moral obligation back in 1948, because the Universal Declaration doesn't bind countries, but it was also reiterated in the 1966 Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. And that isn't just a moral obligation of, of, of nation states who have ratified it, it's also a legal obligation. And that is worth bearing in mind. So teachers who want to talk about human rights, who want to address human rights education, 
um, they can feel, in a sense, depending on the context in which they're working, of course, a sense of security in that the nations they are, are working in have actually signed up to this. Uh, not all governments feel comfortable at all times about talking about human rights education with children, but this is something they've agreed to. Can we have the next slide? So the next slide actually spells this out because we're talking about the 1989 Convention on the Rights of the Child. And this is more or less universally, it's universally signed and almost universally ratified. Um, and it actually spells out that education is for the preparation of the child for responsible life in a free society in the spirit of understanding peace, tolerance, equality of sexes, which is uh, one of the issues we want to focus directly on this evening, and friendship among all peoples, ethnic, national and religious groups, and persons of indigenous origin. So this isn't just some a uh, fancy notion that we're going to do decolonize the curriculum this year or we've suddenly come across or that we are going to do some uh, uh, controversial uh, anti-sexist or gender equity work or anti-racist work. This is something that our governments have all signed up to. And um, I put this... Uh, picture on the left here for two reasons. Uh, one is to, because uh, the book that you see there, Teachers and Human Rights Education, which I wrote with Hugh Starkey back in 2010, is explores these ideas in uh, what I consider a straightforward way. But also it was a book we dedicated to Steve Sinnott at that time, and Mary's nodding. And um, we did that because well, we say why we did it. We did it because I believe Steve was not just a person who talked about human rights and talked about human rights education, but he actually practiced that in his everyday life. And so that's why it's, it's uh, I think, very fitting that, that I, I stuck that picture there today, tonight. And, um, and I, I'm a person, I can bear personal witness to this because when I face particular difficulties in, in my uh, professional career, he recognized those as human rights issues and he stepped, stepped in to offer me very, very concrete and practical advice. And as you can imagine, as the leader of a teachers union, he was able to steer me um, in, in the right direction to get the right kind of professional help I needed. Can we go? Yeah, so the, the goals of human rights education, which are then spelt out in this, um, in this book, are, are threefold, I would argue. First of all, human rights education is about knowledge. It's about especially knowledge about child rights and about enabling young people to have the skills and uh, to know uh, how, how to act, to know how to engage. It's also about attitudes. It's about increasing respect for human rights. And sometimes with very young children, this is taught by, by teaching them to work together, to respect each other's rights. But I think um, even at quite a young age, children need to understand that governments have a responsibility to them as well in this human rights framework. And I think there are very practical ways in, in which that can happen. So it's about attitudes, it's about knowledge. But it's also, if we can look at the next slide, um, uh, it's also very much about skills and being able to, to go forward and take action. We have a, um, a, a very uh, pertinent and visible sign of this in the um, school strikes that we've seen across the globe. But uh, we can think about this very much as um, children uh, being engaged at a local level in their own lives, in their own decision making. And if we think back to the school strike movement, we can see that it began very simply with one young woman, one, one child actually, one very young woman who set about um, a, a lone protest outside the Swedish parliament. So this is not, not, not that we're advocating that people work individually, but together we can have a lot of 
power and we can empower young people. So it's about enabling children, individuals and communities, children and adults to defend their rights and the rights of others. And we often talk about education about rights, through rights and for rights. And that comes from the uh, United Nations Declaration on Human Rights, Education and Training. I'm not going to uh, dwell on that because I want to move on to the practical things that, um, that Beata is going to look at. But I find it useful and I refer to human rights in this book in a very simple way. They can be very complex ideas, but human rights, I think, essentially are about an expression of the human urge to resist oppression. So I think that applies in all societies, in all contexts. This is a universal feeling that we, we express and resist oppression. And this is, a, this is what human rights is about. And I believe that human rights education, whatever it is, whatever it includes, must give impetus to that urge to resist oppression, to re resist injustice. And um, what then um, does this mean in terms of teachers? So we're talking about that we know they've got protection when they're addressing these controversial issues. They can turn to support from uh, 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 international standards, from their colleagues, from their unions, and, and from these uh, international standards that they, if they're familiar with them. But it does imply a, a degree of legal literacy and legal education, which is not currently part of teacher education in many places. And I would also note that, although, although I work in both fields, human rights education is not the same as citizenship education because um, citizenship education is often concerned with promoting national values. Um, in, in Britain, we have notions about fundamental British values. In, in Norway, we talk about Christian and humanist values, and these often become confused. But human rights bring their own set of independent values, which are international and which don't separate us into those who are nationals of the country and those who are outsiders. So for example, I'm not a, a citizen of Norway, I'm not a national of Norway, but that doesn't involve me, that doesn't prevent me from getting involved on a practical level in, in um, citizenship actions and human rights actions. And I think we need to recognize that, he, especially in um, countries of, of the global north, countries, that are rel relatively rich, relatively privileged, privileged, that human rights violations can occur nationally as well as globally. We can't separate these into two neat um, divisions. I referred earlier to um, the notion that uh, that uh, Steve Sinnott stood up for my rights as, uh, as, a, as a friend, as a colleague, but so human rights can occur in the workplace, they can occur at all levels. And I think that that idea is key to understanding the ideas that, that Beata is going uh, to move to now. Oh no, I've got to do one more talk, or are you going to do this one, Beata? Uh, I can do it if you like. Or okay. You, or, okay. <laughs> Yes, um, um, human rights education uh, links very well to the concept of intersectionality. Um, and the first who in, uh, introduced the concept of intersectionality was Kimberly Crenshaw. And she looked at how the intersection, especially between race and gender, uh, plays a role when it comes to the degree of legal recognition. And she exemplified this very um, practically in a way. Uh, and she um, illustrated especially black women's experience um, when they met the, the, the US legal system. And she said that, and she wrote that um, black women's experience with sexual violence is not the same as white women's experience with sexual violence. And she said that it's because of the degree of legal recognition. And, um, and 
as a, as an example, she said that it would be unheard of historically that a black woman would be, um, um, or a, a white man would be uh, actually convicted for having raped a black uh, woman. And uh, her paper uh, is very influential in uh, my paper because I see that these different um, axes of differentiation also plays a part when it comes to um, the degree to which children's rights are recognized. And Audrey, Audrey also has written about how we can use the concept of intersectionality to um, explore how learners experience justice or injustice in school and equality and in uh, inequality. And um, what we would like to emphasize is that um, human rights education gives emphasis to the whole person. And, and, and it aims to recognize the whole person and, and the complex experiences of, of the whole person, um, I would say. It's a good uh, theoretical background for what is coming. And um, human rights education links to sustainable development goal four because um, the Sustainable Development Goal 4, it aims to ensure inclusive and equitable quality education and promote lifelong learning opportunities for all, regardless of gender. Um, and what we will discuss further uh, is that sexual harassment could be an, a severe impediment for uh, equal access to, to education. Uh, and it can also um, contribute to a school dropout, which, um, which, um, which needs more research. But uh, we, I find that there might be a link between sexual harassment and, and school dropout. And um, now I would like to turn a bit to the political context uh, in Norway, because uh, Norway has this image of uh, having a high degree of, of human development and a high degree of gender equality. Um, and the picture you see here is a picture from 2013, where we have uh, our female prime minister female uh, minister of foreign affairs and a uh, female minister of finance. And we see that women are highly represented in political uh, positions. But my question is, um, what about gender equality in everyday life for young students? And this dimension is a bit under communicated, I think because we have an image that doesn't necessarily um, coincide with the actual life of, of young adolescents when it comes to gender equality. And uh, the picture you see here is from, uh, um, uh, is from the 8th of March, International Women's Day, uh, where young adolescents uh, took out to the streets and, um, on this uh, picture you see, I go to school, do not call me a whore, stop sexism in school. And this was in the aftermath of a big media debate regarding Me Too and that Me Too never actually reached the schoolyard because um, the public media debate was very much focused on uh, adults experience with sexual violence and very little focus on um, or less focus on young, uh, young um, children's experience with um, sexual violence. Although this has also been highlighted to some extent uh, through um, the dark room investigation, which has been a widespread uh, investigation regarding uh, child sexual abuse digitally. Uh, so there has been some uh, in media, but 
uh, what I see is that what goes on in public media doesn't necessarily coincide with what, what is happening in the everyday interaction between people. And before I go to the, to the cultural taboo, I would like to say a bit more about the Norwegian context in, in regards to sexual harassment, because uh, research shows that 29% uh, of girls and 7% of boys aged 18 to 19 years have experienced sexual harassment in quite severe forms. Uh, and when I refer to sexual harassment in severe forms, I refer to sexual harassment that borders to sexual abuse and that it also entails physical unwanted touching. And sexual harassment is uh, often not taken seriously. Uh, several studies indicate that this is the case. And um, what I find in, in my own research is that there is a cultural taboo in everyday interaction. Because on one hand, you have a high degree of public media coverage of sexual harassment and abuse um, targeting uh, children and adolescents, although not uh, as high as when it targets uh, adults during the, the Me Too. And there's a less degree of dealing with these issues in the everyday life at school, less degree of teaching about sexual harassment and child sexual abuse in everyday interaction in class. And um, this cultural taboo, it works in different ways. Um, it works both for um, the, the child who experienced it, and it's very much linked to shame, that it's shameful to have experienced sexual violence and, and therefore uh, many children um, choose not to, to talk about it. And um, it's also, uh, it also works for, it also work maybe as kind of like prevention that you should not engage uh, in sexual contact with children in a way. So it, it's two, two faced, but I also see that, um, yes, I will see, I will explore the perspective of teachers uh, later uh, in this presentation. And before I, uh, go further, I would like to um, explain a bit about uh, the methodology of how I research these issues, because in 2018 I conducted phone interviews with 64 social studies teachers, and I had a very structured survey, and I was ticking the boxes regarding their age, their background, their educational level, um, and the degree to which they were teaching about uh, different aspects related to sexual violence. Uh, and among those uh, aspects, whether or not they addressed rape among adolescents and child sexual abuse. And I also wanted to see whether or not they found it difficult to address these um, topics. And then uh, in one of the interviews, I talked to a young a teacher named Inga. And although I, although my plan was not to map teacher's own experience with sexual harassment, uh, she told me that one of her most challenging moments as a teacher was when she experienced being sexually harassed by her own students. And um, I decided to um, do an additional in-depth interview with Ingun to explore her perspectives on how she dealt with this incident. And uh, through that in-depth interview, I also uh, got information about how one of her young students, Mary, had been uh, sexually harassed by boys in her class. And, um, and we will see a bit further on how she, she dealt with that. And what Ingen experienced was 
that if, well, she was uh, working as a teacher for a class specializing in vocational studies. And there were only boys, 17 year old boys and one girl, Mary. And they had a kind of like a culture of harassing each other. The boys harassed each other and they also um, were um, what Ingen would uh, characterize as teasing Ingen and always like pushing the limits for what they could say. And Ingen's strategy was to use humor and, and joke about it and, and try to and not to be too strict. And that did not turn out to be a successful strategy because the whole thing kind of culminated uh, one day in class when one of the boys uh, asked her whether or not she was any good at giving blowjobs. And that kind of was the, it was um, the final straw for Ingan. And she went directly to her uh, principal's office and she told her about her experience. And, and the principal recognized her experience and she was very supportive. Um, but, um, but Mary's experience was not necessarily recognized to the same extent. But before we go on to Mary, I would like to say a bit about how Ingen actually dealt with this situation. Um, she decided to gather the class and she removed like all the desks and she put the chairs in a circle and she was very honest about her feelings. She said that I feel humiliated, I feel disrespected, and I feel that we cannot go on having this kind of environment in our classroom. And what you said is actually not legal. And she, she emphasized the illegal part, which is an implicit um, implicit link to human rights education because she she taught she told about her own rights and how they had violated her rights in a way but she did not use uh, an explicit uh, an explicit uh, legal uh, framework that, like the um, uh, the CEDAW, the International Convention on Elimination of Discrimination Against Women she did not use that framework explicitly, but she said that it's actually not legal to talk that way to, to other people. And she made them comment on the situation. She made each student um, share their perspective. And before she did this, she said, I was sure that I had lost that class. She thought that she had ruined the relation with her class because she, she would approach it in a strict way. But she said that after this honest conversation, she actually felt that her relation to the students were strengthened. Um, so I would say that Ingen's case had a, a happy ending in a way, but it was not so happy for Mary because um, Mary, she experienced receiving, among other things, very sexualized phone messages by the boys in her class, uh, asking uh, whether or not she could come over so that they could have group sex. And she was the only girl uh, in the class consisting of only her and, and boys. So she was in a very vulnerable position. And when I asked Ingan if she knows whether or not the boy stopped harassing Mary after this conversation, she, she does not know. And um, I also wanted to know what happened to Mary. And Ingan told me that she dropped out of school. And I have tried to uh, get in contact with Mary to see whether or not her dropping out of school actually um, is connected to the harassment because it's it's severe when you experience being harassed like that and, and no one intervenes. It's a clear uh, breach of her rights to protection from, from discrimination and harassment. Uh, but what happened is that I was kind of, I was 
denied access to information about Mary. Um, and I think it, I, I'm not quite sure why, but it could be that the school wouldn't let me in <laughs> on it in a way in, in or so that they wouldn't look bad, but I would, uh, everything would be totally anonymous. So it doesn't really make sense, but, but I was ac denied access and that's why uh, her perspective is not included in this uh, presentation. But we, what we did do is we tried to look at what does a young adolescent say about harassment. And that's why we applied a kind of like a mixed method and we included a survey among uh, young adolescents where we uh, mapped uh, how often the respondents hear abusive words, uh, racist and sexist words, and 47 of the respondents hear abusive words every day or every week out of almost 400 adolescents in the southern part of Norway. And what is very um, concerning is that 38% of the respondents answer that people never or rarely intervened. So one of our arguments in, in the Me Too article is that um, Mary's experience is not unique, that children often experience racist or sexist uh, comments uh, without anyone actually intervening. And if we are to look at this in a human rights education perspective, uh, we see that the through part, the actually protecting children's rights in practice is lacking. And um, I also link Mary's case and, and Ingen's dialogue um, to transformative human rights education because Ingen based uh, the dialogue on her own experience of uh, sexual harassment. And it was, um, it was based on the experience that it kind of became uh, transformative. And, Mary, and Ingen said that if we didn't have that experience, I don't think they would have gotten it, that they wouldn't have understood what it's about in a way, that it's, that it's emotional and that it's illegal and that it's not in tune with the legal framework. Um, but I, we see that there's a clear difference between how adults' rights to protection from harassment is protected and how children's rights are protected. And we interpret, um, we interpret Ingen's dealing with the harassment in an intersectional perspective, Mary's gender and age and status as a pupil, it matters when it comes to how seriously sexual harassment is taken. And um, like Elizabeth Meyer, we also link it to the institutional culture of the school, um, where not only Ingan did not recognize Mary's experience, but several teachers, they did not act. Um, and that's a, a kind of like an institutional barrier to safeguarding children's rights. And um, if we are to uh, look at similarities between uh, the phone survey and the case study, uh, I find that children's rights to knowledge, skills and protection is not taken seriously enough. Uh, I find that teachers address rape among young peers and child sexual abuse to a very small extent. They also talk about the legal literacy protecting against harassment and abuse to a very small extent. And there is no, there's little or no intervention when young learners report being sexually harassed. And my um, concern or my interest in is how, how can this be? How can we understand what is going on? And then um, I had another epiphany one day uh, about how everything is linked from a micro level 
uh, and upward to an um, what I call a super level, which I will take you through now. Um, and I've tried to make a model of how I look at this. How can it be that children's rights in this regard is not respected? And when it comes to directly to uh, England's case, uh, we go straight to the micro level, teachers practice and emotional work. Um, we see that not uh, intervening in Mary's case, it can be uh, linked to um, a concern of being in, involved in conflict in a way, which, uh, which is uh, a point from Darley and Latan. Um, and when she did not address Mary's, she did not address Mary's experience in the conversation with, with the class. Uh, but we interpret that as a way of caring about Mary in a way because she did not want to put Mary in, in a vulnerable position. And she sought to use herself as an example rather than Mary. Um, and um, so we interpret that as um, one dimension of, of emotional work. But at the same time, she did not recognize Mary's experience. She did not recognize her rights as, in, as enshrined in the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. And um, this model, I use this model also to look at how, um, how can it be that teachers do not address sexual harassment uh, among young adolescents in uh, teaching. And I find that there is very little focus on sexual violence in social science textbooks. There is little explicit focus in the, in the curriculum. And there is little focus from the school management regarding enabling teachers competence on sexual violence. And there is also little cooperation among social science teachers when it comes to designing teaching lessons together. And uh, but what I did find when I, I did a regression analysis of the phone survey, I find that when teachers actually learn about uh, sexual violence in their own uh, education, they teach more about it in their own teaching. And that's um, also linked to, um, linked to what Ori was saying, that there is not enough legal literacy in teacher education. And I believe that if it had been more focused on sexual violence in teacher education, more focused on the legal literacy that they need to really implement the human rights education, we would be better off than we are today. So I find that there are a lot of structures and emotions that are um, inhibiting teachers from actually carrying out human rights education. But even though their practice is heavily conditioned by structures, I would also like to emphasize their agency. And that's the agency, the agent agentic part is, is part of our conclusion. Would you like to, to um, um, Tune in on the conclusion, Audrey. Thank you. <laughs> I, I think um, you've seen a very detailed case study here of, of how sexual harassment happens, goes unchecked, how teachers uh, are inhibited from acting. And our conclusion in this is that teachers obviously need to act on these particular cases, but they actually need to be human rights activists. They actually need to engage with human rights on, on a everyday level. It's not a question of um, uh, thinking, well, um, I engage with this international NGO, I, or I donate money to this charity, or I do this. It's actually about recognizing the everyday uh, relevance of human rights, and then that teachers are engaged. And I, uh, we argue that human rights actually gives power to teachers. It gives them a protection, it gives them hope, and it gives them uh, a sense of solidarity with others in their own 
environments, in the wider national environment in which they might uh, work, for example, through the union or through other organizations they're engaged in, um, through local groups, but also internationally. We shouldn't separate these, that human rights education, we argue, empowers teachers to address questions of power, because these are very much questions of power that, that Beata has talked about. We're not talking about, it, it's very, very interesting that the case shows Inga was able to address her own situation, but she didn't necessarily recognize her position of relative power in relation to her very, very vulnerable students. It should enable teachers to identify power, to engage with power, injustice and rights in a more effective way. And that's what human rights education, we argue, offers to the teacher. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much. And for more details, please um, uh, tune into Human Rights Education Review and, and look at the articles and you will find more details. <laughs> Thank you. I, before we hand over to, um, to, uh, um, to Anne to, to chair this or to take questions from you, I would like to say that I have another student uh, sitting here in the audience, uh, Keshti, who's also has a, a great deal of expertise in, in, in this area. So I hope um, that together we can have an interesting discussion now. Thank you. Thank you everyone for joining us today. But I would just like to really warmly thank Audrey and Beate for doing this really informative presentation. There's been loads of comments in the chat about how everybody's found it really, really useful. And um, I'm sure you'll have a bit of follow up afterwards. The thing that I think I really take away from this and some something that the Steve Senate Foundation uh, really believes is that we are all interconnected and we have a responsibility to each other. And um, I, I think we could do some more work on this. We could actually have another session at some point in the future. And I hope um, we could work on that together. So um, yes, thank you everyone for joining us, um, for sharing your learning and participating. And um, I hope to see you all very, very soon. Thank you.